Bob Hoskins tries to solve two murders while coping with a cartoon character in the ambitious new film, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It's one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert. I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It's one of those home runs that Hollywood hits every once in a while. It's a movie like 2001 or Close Encounters or especially like E.T. that's a technical breakthrough and a lot of fun both at the same time. This movie is great entertainment from one end to the other, but it's also one of those films where you're always asking yourself, how did they do that? The movie takes place in Hollywood in 1947 where it assumes the cartoon characters and human beings were living side by side and working in the movies. It tells the story of a cartoon star named Roger Rabbit who gets framed for a murder and has only one chance of being cleared, a private eye named Eddie Valiant, played by Bob Hoskins. How did you get in here? Through the mail slot. I thought it would be best if I waited inside, seeing how I'm wanted for murder. No kidding. Just now, notice there how realistically the animation is combined with the real world. It looks like Roger Rabbit is really there in the human universe. And look at the way here that real water and a cartoon rabbit interact in this scene as the bad guys come looking for Roger and Hoskins hides him. Okay, wise guy. Where's the rabbit? I haven't seen him. What's in there? My lingerie. Ah! See, I am. <laughs> Roger Rabbit has a sexy wife named Jessica who is briefly suspected of trying to frame him. She's a singer who performs at the famous Ink and Paint Club. Listen to her voice here. It was dubbed by Kathleen Turner. I'd do anything for my husband, Mr. Valiant. Anything. The cartoon characters are named Toons in this movie, and one of the things that makes them different from humans is that their lives are governed by the cliches of animated cartoons. That explains how and why Roger can get out of those handcuffs. Does this help? Yeah, thanks. Do you mean to tell me that you could have taken your hand out of that cuff at any time? No, not at any time. Only when it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, where's his sense of humor? He always is funny, or only on days when he's wanted for murder. And it's amazing there how they really seem to exist in the same physical universe. In previous movies, you might have a little cartoon character dancing on somebody's shoulder, but they never really seem to really be there. There have been a lot of previous movies where animation was combined with live action. For example, Song of the South with Br'er Fox interacting with Uncle Remus, or Mary Poppins, but it's never been done anywhere near this well before. What I want to do now is look at this scene the coming up now from the movie and pay special attention to what the filmmakers are doing and how. amazing there where she seems to actually be touching his cheeks this is jessica in a nightclub scene and now watch how she's all over bob hoskins here that's amy irving's singing voice look her hand goes under the coat the coat goes back the hat leaves now it's pushed in his face the way they did this was to have all of the props operated by hidden wires or by hidden operators so that later on when the animation comes in the props would move just as if the animated characters were moving them 
But the hard part for Hoskins, look at him there, he really seems to be looking at her, and he had to act through this whole movie all by himself. He had to imagine that there was a girl there. He does a great job, and then look, his tie pulls out, and it's dropped again. It's just amazing the way those cartoon characters are integrated with the real thing. It's terrifically well done, so well done that after a while you give up trying to figure things out and just go along with the story, which has some serious undertones as those tunes are treated like second-class citizens. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a co-production of the Disney and Spielberg companies, directed by Bob Zemeckis, who made Back to the Future, and the animation is by Richard Williams, who's Raggedy Ann and Andy we liked several years ago. One of the most impressive of their achievements here was to convince other Hollywood studios to loan out their cartoon stars. So we see not only Disney characters like Mickey Mouse, but Warner Brothers heroes like Bugs Bunny. I could hardly believe it when there was a piano duet starring the two great ducks, Donald and Daffy. This is a wonderful movie, one of the year's best oh, films. Oh, I think so, absolutely mm -hmm. true. And again, the dominant reaction that I had, mouth agape, how did they do that? Now, one of the tricks that I learned that was very interesting, an improvement in t cartoon technology is, and even an improvement over the classic Disney cartoons like Snow White, which would animate every other frame, mm -hmm. so that it would, instead of 24 frames a second, uh, like you see a person on movies, mm -hmm. they did it 12 frames to save money. Mm -hmm. And two frames are similar. Every single frame here is animated. Mm -hmm. They wanted the animation to look as bright and real. All 24 frames are animated, just like Bob Hoskins is running at 24 frames. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the film is brighter, more exciting than most cartoon things that we've ever seen, including the opening four or five minute cartoon, pure cartoon sequence that opens the movie that is so dazzling and yes, so funny oh, that's... that I tell you, I'm going back to that movie to see that the sequence opening, again. The opening sequence yes. of five minutes had me laughing louder I, than any cartoon I've ever seen. It was hysterical. And then you're quite right when you go through this film. They cast shadows. Yes. They seem to, the floorboards bend under their yeah. weight. When they uh, are in the dishwater, the water is moving. How they did it? is obviously they just worked and worked and worked. And one of the achievements that we really should point out, I think, is that Bob Hoskins was able to interact with ima an, an imagination. It's like Alec Guinness in the uh, Star Wars movie saying he had to spend all of his time in an empty room yeah. imagining spaceships there, which okay. it's really hard this to This is act bigger like than that. that. Bob Hoskins mm -hmm. was picked, I'm told he was not the first choice, that they wanted to go after some comic actors, uh -huh. well-known comic actors, instead of Hoskins. I think they made the right choice going with Hoskins as counterpoint to the... Let, let Daffy Duck be funny. Yeah. You need uh -huh. an iron center, sort of a Sam Spade kind of character. Right. And Bob Hoskins, for my money, is the best guy to well, do it now. He now. is matter of fact. If he oh. were going around all the time saying, oh my God, look, yeah. this is a, a uh, oh, this is Bugs yeah. Bunny here, yeah. uh, nobody would think that was funny. But the fact that he's seen these tunes all of his life and it's routine and he accepts them makes the movie seem more realistic. Here's the big question I have. Who is the film going to be more entertaining for, adults or kids? I know who I think. I think more for adults. You, I agree, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Coming up next, John Candy and Dan Aykroyd are brother-in-laws who brave the great outdoors. Why the hell would you want to come up to a plant-infested no-man's land like this and live like a barbarian for a week? The Great Outdoors, a family vacation comedy triggered undoubtedly by the success of Chevy Chase's two big hit National Lampoon vacation films. But The Great Outdoors isn't even in that class. It's even more disappointing considering it stars Dan Aykroyd and John Candy, two big talents. There are very few moments worthy of either of their talents. Candy plays a regular family guy from Chicago who takes his clan to a vacation in Wisconsin's North Woods. And after Candy and his wife check into their cabin, they get romantic, but in walks an uninvited guest, his obnoxious rich brother-in-law, Dan Aykroyd. Uh, you will be uh, Shilana. <laughs> Shilana, the oak tree woman. I love it when I'm the oak tree woman. Temptress of the woods. Yes. 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 And I will be Bert. Bert. A guy named Bert. <laughs> or I could be uh, Smokey's uh, cousin Horny. <laughs> I'll do whatever you want. Anybody home? <laughs> That's a dumb party joke, not worthy of Dan Aykroyd. The two men have differing views about nature. This is a case of a businessman versus the average Joe. Look around you, Roman. For God's sakes, this is this is this is beautiful country here. Take a good look. I'll tell you what I see when I look out there. If you want to know. Hey, yeah, I'm curious. I see the underdeveloped resources of northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. I see a syndicated development consortium exploiting over a billion and a half dollars in forest products. I see a paper mill, and if the strategic metals are there, a mining operation. A green belt between the condos on the lake and a waste management facility, focusing on the newest rage in toxic waste, medical refuse. 
More than half of the movie is given over to lame hijinks, physical hijinks, especially ones involving candy and a bear. You can spot this one coming. Big bear! Big bear! <laughs> no! True! True! Oh, dear! We're glad you're home, honey. Big bear! Chase! Big bear, chase! What is he saying? What? Big bear, chase me! Now look closely at the bear. Look down at the bottom of the frame. You can see the trainer's stick actually hitting the bear to make him growl. Uh, uncle! 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 Uh. Listen, if that were the only technical mistake in the film, I still might like the picture. This picture stinks all the way through. Candy and Aykroyd are marvelous talent. Aykroyd has shown in past pictures that he's a better talent than Candy, who succeeded only for the first time last year with Steve Martin in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. He fails when he's used as just an overweight wind-up toy, which has been his sad state in his career for far too long. It happens again here in the great outdoors. It's very disappointing. Aykroyd has a couple of throwaway lines that are funny, but that's it for what is a very, very weak film. I was shocked. You would think that with the names Aykroyd and Candy connected to a movie, you would have something funny, even if you only just shot a documentary of the two of them sitting around during their lunch that's break. That's my but standard line. they threw away that stuff and just use whatever they had left. Now, this movie was written and produced by John Hughes, who also made Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which is about another odd couple, Candy and Steve Martin, right. who go through a lot of adventures. Very it's almost film. as if he put all of his good stuff in that movie and then took all of the outtakes and put them in this movie, and, outtakes of his script, because this movie is lame and dumb and slow and no good. And didn't you know everything... Everything. ...that was going to happen? I was really... I was Isn't that amazing? The... The, the, the big uh, co commodities guy from Chicago just doesn't like nature. And then the average guy, the happy-go-lucky, chubby guy, he loves animals. Thanks. We appreciate that. Coming up next, ten different directors film ten different operatic scenes in wildly different styles in a movie called Aria. This film is called Aria, an ambitious, spirited project that asks ten different directors to give their visual treatment of arias from ten different operas. As with all compilation movies, some segments are necessarily better than others, and the unevenness is always disturbing. But there are high notes in Aria. My favorite sequences include director Jean-Luc Godard's erotic adaptation of Jean-Baptiste Lully's opera Armide, about a seductive girl contemplating slaying her lover, and Godard uses, of all things, as a setting, a contemporary workout gym where a jealous young woman considers murdering a strong man while her friend looks the other way. Totally different is the contribution of director Charles Sturridge, who worked on TV's Brideshead Revisited. Here he uses black and white photography in adapting Giuseppe Verdi's La Forza del Destino, telling a story about three children in culture shock with burnt out lives. Also fascinating is the segment by Australian director Bruce Beresford, who made the wonderful film Tender Mercies. Here he adapts Eric Korngold's Die Todestat, a more traditional love story aria duet. I liked many more of these little films and the few I didn't enjoy, but there was the feeling of being cheated because of the length, because of the ones you really like, let them run. At the same time, I didn't miss subtitles, which I thought I would have, because these little films, because they are short, you know, eight minutes, whatever, 
there are more exercises in style, really, than full-scale opera. So I'm getting a marginal thumbs up to this film's opera fans. I think will like it even more because they'll like anybody's adaptation of a great aria, and they probably won't want to miss it. Well, I give it a thumbs up, too, and I enjoyed uh, probably three-quarters of it. I That's especially I enjoyed say. a segment you didn't mention, which shows two young people uh, having a honeymoon in Las Vegas. Uh, a totally inappropriate backdrop and setting for the romantic aria that they sing. Yeah. And I thought that was very nice. You know, this movie is now playing around the country uh, in kind of a, a wave of releases. If right. it hasn't come to your town yet, it probably will eventually. But you know where I think I'm really going to enjoy it is when it comes out on video, and especially on Laserdisc with that great sound. It's kind of like a, a top 40 of opera or something. Uh, with all of these wonderful visuals, it's sort of like the first music video of opera. Yeah, I just wish, and I don't know if you feel the same way, I wish for the good ones, uh, especially the Godard film, which I thought was just uh -huh. great. I wish he'd gone twice. Well, of course, as long. you can you can get a lot of operas, you know, on disc and tape. I'm if you talking want. You about look the, at the whole. Yeah, opera. but I'm talking about these guys, these good, really fine filmmakers. I don't know. Let them run. Given Godard's record in the last five or six years, I'm not sure I'd want to see a 90-minute movie I, of an opera. I'm not talking him. 90. I think he's found his right length at about nine minutes. I'm not asking 90. 19 would be good. Just more. That's what I want. Now, when we come back, we're going to discuss an important issue in film. Should some great movies be protected? as if they were national treasures, just like historical landmarks, buildings, whatever. Some congressmen are saying yes to that notion, but Ted Turner, you know what he says, he says no way. Grandpa Redenbacher, I've got it. Got what, Gary? A snack idea of the century. Take America's favorite microwave popcorn, yours, and add the flavor of cheddar cheese or sour cream and onion. Like this? Orville Redenbacher's new cheddar cheese microwave popcorn. Our sour cream and onion popcorn. Fresh, hot, and mmm. The snack idea of the century. And it's his. Who else? Two hot new microwave snacks from Orville Redenbacher. For the last year or more, a battle has been raging in the movie industry over the issue of colorization, the use of computers to artificially color movies that were originally intended to be seen in black and white. In recent weeks, that battle has broadened out into the larger question of whether some great American films ought to be given sort of a landmark status, like architectural landmarks or historical landmarks, to protect them in their original form for future generations. Legislation is currently under consideration by the United States Congress that would form a National Film Commission, a blue ribbon panel, which could select classic movie masterpieces and declare them to be national treasures. Now, these are the opening shots of Citizen Kane, the 1941 film by Orson Welles, which is generally agreed to be the greatest American film ever made. Ironically, they show no trespassing signs outside Kane's legendary castle, Xanadu, and those signs are almost a warning to colorizers. But the rights to this film are in the hands of Ted Turner, the cable mogul who likes to broadcast colorized versions of movies over his Atlanta superstation. And Turner can't wait to colorize Citizen Kane. But the proposed National Film Act of 1988 would declare Citizen Kane off limits to Turner, just like Kane's own Xanadu. I think, in a way, the fact that they would colorize Citizen Kane has become a rallying cry for this entire crusade because you can say what you want about some of the lousy movies they've colorized, but if Turner tries to get his hands on Citizen Kane, there's going to be trouble. The idea of landmark status in every art form has often divided the investors on one side and the art lovers on the other side. For example, right now, a lot of Broadway theaters in New York have landmark status, but the owners of those theaters would like the freedom to cash in on the valuable real estate under the theaters by tearing them down if necessary and building new ones with high-rises above them. In the same way, the big Hollywood studios and the powerful Motion Picture Association of America, believe it or not, or maybe it's natural, they oppose the proposed Film Preservation Act because the way they see it, they own those films and they want the right to colorize them or pan and scan them or slice and dice them any way they want to if they can make more money. Against them is a coalition of movie directors, writers and actors who want the great old films preserved as they were made. There's no place out there for graft or greed or lies or compromise with human liberties. And that, if that's what the grown-ups have done with this world that was given to them, then we better get those boys camps started fast and see what the kids can do. Jimmy Stewart and Frank Capra once made a movie called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington about a little man who made a difference. 
When the House Appropriations Committee held hearings a week ago, one of the supporters of the Film Preservation Act was veteran actor Jimmy Stewart, who is a bitter opponent of the colorized versions of many of his movies. Here he's reading a letter from Frank Capra. Bill asks you to set aside from the billions of dollars you will authorize this year a modest $500,000 so that the future generations will have a chance to perceive the best films their country has produced as they were meant by their creators to be perceived. Ted Turner has already shown colorized versions of It's a Wonderful Life and the Maltese Falcon. They're working on Casablanca. Citizen Kane is next. There is nothing that is sacred to this man when it comes to movies. Except the money that can be made off of them in That's any right. way in mutilating them. This legislation may have some problems in terms of the way that it's written because uh, it's very unclear as to what considers alteration. Whether you can put commercials in there, whether you can pan and scan, it's going to require the uh, uh, the approval of the director and principal writer in the film. Well, what the legislation says is, first of all, no colorization, and then in terms, they can put commercials in, but in terms of shortening the movie, leaving right. out scenes, right. uh, compressing time to get it into a shorter thing, it's like the example of Milos Forman, who once turned on television to watch a version of his movie Hair and found that nine of the musical numbers, nine of the musical numbers right. have been cut out. Well, we all know great musicals, Singing in the Rain, where they take out musicals. That's the kind of thing that people want to preserve. Yeah. The main thing and the important issue here is that finally Congress is taking films as seriously as it has taken buildings. And that's a compliment to both architecture and to film. Now let's take a look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs up and two jaws dropping open in admiration for the animated live action extravaganza who framed Roger Rabbit? Two thumbs down for the wimpy comedy, The Great Outdoors. And we both like many of the segments within Aria. Two thumbs up for that. And of course, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is the dazzler this week. It's one of those movies that you, you sit there and you want to see it a second time. Absolutely. There's just too much happening. I too couldn't much. take it all in. Yeah. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll take a look at the film career of comedian Robin Williams from his earliest days as a stand-up comic to his Oscar-nominated performance in Good Morning Vietnam. And until then... The balcony is closed.